Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. I'm Jason Abrams, and this is the place where we lift the curtain on the world of real estate like never before. Every week, I sit down with visionaries, pirates, and mavericks. We're here to document, demonstrate, and most importantly, demystify their game-changing models and systems. What secrets propel them to the top, and how are they living their dreams? This is about passion, it's about strategy, but above all, it's about real, tangible success. So buckle up and let's dive in. This is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. Now, you know you've made it when you have 6 million followers on Instagram, 2.3 million followers on the Facebook. You've written multiple books, such as The High Five Habit, Stop Saying You're Fine, and the focus of today's podcast, which is The Five Second Rule. But here's the thing that blows me away. Mel Robbins has had her TED Talk explaining The Five Second Rule viewed over 31 million times. Top it all off with having one of the top 20 podcasts in the world. And you now know everything you need to know about our guest today. Friends, today I am joined by none other than Mel Robbins. Sit back, buckle up, and get ready to explore the five-second rule. Mel, how are you? I'm great. It is an honor for us to have you. Thank you for being here. Of course. So unless you've been living under a rock, everyone knows who Mel Robbins is, but you might not have read the book, The Five Second Rule. Mel, you are changing lives all over the planet. And although it sounds simple, <laughs> it's highly complex. How did The Five Second Rule come into your world and what is it? Well, um, The Five Second Rule is a, is a little hack that you can use to tap into instant motivation, instant courage, or instant confidence. And uh, I'll explain it first, and then I'll tell you a quick story about how it came to be. You just, in a moment where you feel yourself hesitating, or you feel fear or doubt kicking in, and you know, since you're in the real estate business, it might be a moment where you see somebody, and you have a sense that they're a prospective client, and as you look at them, you have this moment where you think, I should really go up and introduce myself. But then you make this fatal mistake and you stop and think about whether or not you should. And all of these emotions come up and you start to doubt yourself or you feel a little nervous. And within five seconds flat, you go from wanting to do something to talking yourself or feeling yourself out of it. And it happens all day long, every day of your life, these five-second moments of hesitation where you kill possibility, you kill the results that you want, and you stop yourself from taking the actions that change your life. Another area that, you know, as you're listening to this might be relatable is social media. It's an incredibly important aspect of marketing your business and figuring out how to do it in your way with your, your personality probably feels a little out of your comfort zone. And so as you think about doing it, you might feel like, oh, I should do that. But then you stop and think, well, what are my friends going to think? And, you know, what is my uncle going to think? And what about this? And then you don't do it. And another day goes by. And then a week goes by. And now it's another year and you haven't taken charge of your social media. And so the five second rule is very simple. If you're sitting there and you've got your phone and you've just filmed a walkthrough and you want to put it up as a reel on Instagram and then you're like, what's the caption? What did, should I? I don't know. And then you, ah, and you're about to hit draft instead of post, count to yourself, five, four, three, two, one, and then move, hit the post. And it works because counting backwards requires your brain to focus. Like we've been counting up one, two, three, four, five in whatever language you learned to count in since we were little. So we can do that while we're walking and talking and all this stuff. But if you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you have to stop and focus. It's one of the reasons you'll notice why 
Uh, musicians count each other in sure. backwards. Yeah. Teachers in elementary schools, five, four, three, as they're holding up their hand and everybody turns to focus. And you can do the same thing with yourself. And the uses are endless. So uh, simple ways to use it. Tomorrow morning when the alarm rings, instead of laying in bed and reaching for your phone and wasting 45 minutes getting yourself completely freaked out and panic stricken about what's happening on social media or what your client texted you throughout the middle of the night about the stupid inspection and the boiler or this thing or that thing. Who told you about me? Who have you been talking yeah, to well, now? Well, I think that the, I think you either win your mornings are about setting your day up and how your mornings go is how the day ends up. And if you are the kind of person and I get it. Your business is your phone and clients can be wildly emotional and very demanding. And part of it is a service business. And the fact that you feel compelled to respond at three o'clock in the morning to somebody's text about some stupid thing that the buyer or the seller or the this or the that or the other thing, it creates this insanity in you that is not successful. And if you could create a new habit that you're not going to like where the alarm rings and instead of reaching for your phone, you roll out of bed and you carve out even just the first 10 minutes before you look at your phone. Because the thing about the phone is that when you look at it, you immediately lose control of what your priorities are for the day. You have just given your most important commodity as a business person to social media, to your email, and you now are in a defensive position of having to claw your attention and focus back, and you never will. And so your day is won in the first five seconds of the day. And whether or not you reach for your phone and you turn your brain and your attention and your emotions over to what you start scrolling through. Stop it. Gosh, so this is about immediately getting into the right actions. Yes. Even though we might be used to getting into the wrong ones. Yeah, well, you have a habit. Like, we all have a habit of looking at our phone. It's now reflexive. We don't even think about it. And I can prove it to you. Like, I, I have to plug my phone in the bathroom. I cannot be trusted. I'm basically an <laughs> addict. And so are you. Yep. Like everybody. Mine's is. sitting in front of me of at the course, moment. Of course. Of course. And so you have to, and if you were to take this challenge, you will see how weak you are. Plug your phone into the bathroom tonight. Turn on the ringer. And what's interesting about your clients is your clients will text you all day long, but they only actually call if it's a real issue. Sure. And so... Knowing that that's true, if there's a real issue, your clients can reach you, your kids can reach you, put it in the bathroom, go to bed, and you'll notice when you wake up, you're going to reach for it reflexively, and you're going to be like, oh my God. And then you're going to feel panicky because it's not there, and then you're going to get out of bed, and the reason I put it in the bathroom is because by the time I get to the bathroom, like five, ten steps, whatever, I now am present enough to make a choice. And see, I know I can make more money and I can be happier, and I can be more productive if I am psycho-selfish, and I'm also really, really competitive with that time. Why do you think there's so much destructive self-talk that happens to all of us? Mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, the voice in our head mm -hmm. turns out to be wildly powerful, mm -hmm. and yet unqualified to give any of the advice it does, and it feels like it's giving advice or direction constantly. Well, do you want the psychological answer? I want any answer that brings me closer to peace. Okay. Everybody struggles with this. It is a function of human development. So when you go to school, I don't remember what age it is. I think it's somewhere between six and eight. Developmentally speaking, you start to notice as a kid where you are like people and where you're not like people. And your self-talk comes from two places. It comes from both the adults and caregivers around you. So if you had very critical people around you, you just absorb that just like you absorbed English or Spanish or French. It's a language in and of itself. So that's one thing. 
So you likely have the same narrative in your mind that the adults were speaking or kind of admitting to you, and you may not even remember it. Your brain uh, is in a what's called a theta state from zero to five, where it is hyper-absorbing information. And so, number one, you've got the subconscious programming of all the adults around you. Number two, uh, as children, we don't have a... Uh, it's a skill called attribution. Children do not have the skill of attribution, and that's what this means. When mom is in a bad mood, a child cannot look at mom and go, I can attribute her bad mood and her meanness to something that happened at work. Yes, Correct. So the way a human being is designed is, and it's sad that this is what happens, is that you actually as a child have no ability to attribute her behavior to anybody but yourself. And so you internalize, she's mad because of me. And that then starts to become also part of that internal critical dialogue. And if you grew up in a household where and let's face it, you know, I'm 55. I don't know how old you are. I'm a millennial. Okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm 44. <laughs> okay. So, but most of our parents' generations had no therapy. They had no idea how to tolerate their emotions. They didn't know the word trauma. They didn't get the support that they needed to be able to not tantrum as adults. And so almost every single human being goes through childhood and has some sort of negative experience, whether it's abuse or it's neglect or it is just kind of emotional instability. You got a mom that does a silent treatment. You got a dad that sounds off. And so you as a kid develop an internal narrative that you're the problem or that there's something that you could do or behave a different way to try to make everybody okay. And so it begins there. And then when you go to school, and you start to have to navigate, how do I sit still? How do I like get grades? How do I not get laughed at? Your self-talk, believe it or not, even though it's negative, is trying to protect you from everybody else's criticism. Don't raise your hand. Don't do this. Don't go to those kids. But you are instead silencing yourself or editing yourself. And so that's where it begins. And I think one of the biggest opportunities of being an adult is just because you get to adulthood and you have a really negative, critical voice, which just assume everybody on the planet does. Everybody's beating the hell out of themselves. Everybody thinks that they're like doing a bad job. Everybody is trashing themselves. Everybody sees the things that they're doing wrong instead of the things that, and even the people that are walking around with swagger they're still hard on themselves. You have an opportunity as an adult to change the way that you talk to yourself. And one of the things that I truly believe is that the idea that being hard on yourself makes you more successful is complete baloney. Did you hear what she just said? She said that the self-talk and telling yourself the things that you're currently telling yourself is complete baloney. And by the way, this is something I truly believe in. There's a great book by Mara Gleason. Now, if you don't know Mara, Mara is a student of the great Sidney Banks. And this, of course, he's the founder of this idea of the three principles of mind, consciousness, and thought. In any event, she makes the argument that the voice in your head is literally one of the most powerful forces in the universe. She says that all human experience is personalized, thought-divided experience of an underlying impersonal energy that connects us all. Now listen to this. The more and more and more thinking we run through our system, the more separate, noisy, burdened, and individualized our experience gets. And for many of us, the older we get, the more we define ourselves by our thinking and the more tightly we tend to hold on to those thoughts. Friends, that is 100% right. What Mel is saying is that the voice in your head is wildly powerful. It is impacting every single thing you're doing. That's why this idea of these five seconds is so powerful. Five, four, three, two, one, action. That short circuits the voice in your head, which is going to come up with all the reasons why you shouldn't take action. So what she's saying, stop with the thoughts, start with the actions. 
the research shows that the kinder you are to yourself, the more encouraging you are to yourself, the more you have the kind of narrative in your own head, like, okay, whatever, I didn't get, I didn't get the sale, or I priced that house wrong, or uh, whatever it may be, or, you know, it always, ha- it, things like that never happen to somebody, like, whatever your narrative is, the more you can be like, I'm proud of myself for trying. You know, I, I made the wrong call, and I'm going to learn from it. When you can start to talk to yourself, and one of the best ways to do it, if you're really trashing yourself, is to talk to yourself, I think it's the third person where you use your own name, Mel, you made the wrong call, <laughs> girl. Let's learn from that. Like, you kind of create this this distance, they call it objectification. You, you create this, or excuse me, ob- objectivity that allows you to see the way that you're talking and you also hear it differently when you use your own name. You, when, when I was reading your book, um, I almost felt angry in that I looked back on my life and I looked back on all the school and I looked back on all the experiences and I had never taken a course about moving through fear. Mm. And I don't know if every educator just assumed I was going to figure it out on my own. But I can't fathom why this isn't the topic that's being discussed at every grade level. Well, here's the problem about moving through fear is that you can't do it in your mind. Like, I, I think that's, that's the major problem is that we're trying to sort out issues related to self-doubt and issues related to emotional triggers by thinking through them. So how do I move around it? Go neck down. Um, assume, like, you need to be the kind of person that understands what you want and what actions you need to take daily in order to create what you want. And instead of letting your emotions decide whether or not you are going to make the call or take the walk outside or drink your water before you're going to drink coffee, or whatever it may be that are the little things. That we, I mean, all this shit works. Yes. It's a matter of doing them. And the reason why we don't do them is because we go up from the neck up and we think about whether or not we want to do them. And then we consider our feelings. How do I feel about it? Like if you think about, like think about the the act of, there was an interesting, there's a lot, there's a guy, a uh, neuroscientist called Damasio that researches emotions and decision-making. And, you know, I can give you an example. You're making probably 95% of your decisions based on the emotions that you feel versus based on the action that's consistent with what you want. And I can give you an example. When you go to a restaurant and you crack open the menu and you start scanning it, what do you ask yourself as you're scanning the menu? What do I feel like? Yeah, what do I feel like eating tonight? Sure. And so you're making a decision not based on, okay, well, what's going to be the best thing for me? Or if I have pasta, I'm going to have to take a freaking nap. It's so good, I, though. It is so it's good. It's so good. It's so good. It's true. We're going to Carbone tonight. I can't even. Fantastic. It's, it's you're going to need a stretcher to get out of there. Yes. And it's going to be fantastic. But you're right. I never start with, what should I eat tonight? What yeah, would be or, the best or, thing for Yeah, me? or like if I'm going to choose to drink alcohol tonight, then I'm choosing not to sleep. And I'm, I'm down with that. Versus... I'm trying to get better sleep. I am in menopause. I got a big meeting tomorrow, but I feel like having a glass of wine. You know, you know what I'm saying? And so, like, here's the thing. Don't wait for motivation. Don't wait to feel like it. Become the kind of person that leads with action. Becomes the kind of person that just does what needs to get done. I don't particularly consider myself, for example, to be the most disciplined person. Because when I hear the word discipline... I hear somebody that has tremendous, like, kind of, like, grind it, mental strength, all that stuff. I do, however, consider myself to be an extremely pragmatic person that understands that I will never feel motivated to go to the gym. I will never feel motivated uh, at night to uh, just pour seltzer instead of a delicious glass of wine. I will never feel motivated to wake up early and uh, ignore the phone. And when I acknowledge that in myself, that I cannot count on motivation, I can't count on willpower, I can't count on feeling like it, but what I can count on is I can count on Mel to be pragmatic and go, okay, I know I don't want to get out of bed, but I also know what I want. 
And that means I got to get my ass out of bed. And you, you see what I'm saying? Like Absolutely. I lead with the outcome and I lead with the goal. And I just know that the secret in life is action. Like align the action every day. And it's not the big stuff. It's the little reps. Like that's the other big thing is that, you know, there's a lot of people that, that enter the real estate business because it's, it's easy to get in. And then you get in and you go, oh gosh, I got to, I got to market these houses. I got to spend some of my own money. Oh gosh, I got to sit at a, at an open house on a Sunday, on a Sunday. Um, there's all these other realtors jumping in. Now I feel like the mouth, the, the, it's too crowded. And there's the one realtor in the small town that's been doing this forever. And how does that person feel about me coming in? And you got all these feelings about it. And is this a real job? Is it not a job? And that it's going to take you probably three years before you really get the hang of it. And you start to feel like you're making money. And most people bounce because it gets hard. And then you start feeling all these things. And then you start telling yourself all these things. And if you understand that the feeling that that feeling of things being difficult is part of the bargain of success and that you can be successful. You can be healthier. You can make more money. You can lose the weight. You could double your business. There's a small series of things that you, that people that do those things do every day. And so figure out, you know, with real estate, there's income producing activities. What are they? It's all about relationships. It's how many times a day are you talking about it. What are you doing with social media? How active are you in your community? Do you have a plan to create referrals? Because the people that you've sold your houses to are actually going to move. And you can get, like, there's a whole, there's so much to do. And people sit around in their feelings and then wonder why they're not successful. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea of getting into action is such a powerful one. We had Tony Robbins the other day, and he said that action will equal emotion. You have to get into action, then your emotions will change, and you can change your state. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I, I, I follow all of your stuff. I listen to the podcast. You have one of the largest podcasts the world has ever known. And it isn't just in one city, and it isn't just in one state, and it isn't just in one country. This is a universal idea. Mm -hmm. At this point, though, you could go sit on your yacht and just love life. What keeps you waking up every day and pouring into people like you are? Knowing that I was so stuck because I didn't know any better. I got to interrupt you only because I know some of you don't actually know Mel's story. Well, as you learn more about her and listen to more of her podcasts, her story will come out. But imagine this. The world is humming along fantastic in 2005, 6, and 7. Everybody knows what happened in 2008. At the time, Mel and her husband had opened a restaurant. Then they opened a second location. Then the recession hits, and friends, this entire thing falls apart, and she wakes up one day, eight hundred thousand dollars in debt and spending way too many evenings drinking way more than she should she's very transparent about this and she ends up in this two or three year funk the business isn't good the drinking and health isn't good and her relationship with her husband isn't good then one day she is literally watching television now what you don't know is that 15 minutes before she started watching television she had received a phone call and the phone call gave her the opportunity and when I say opportunity, I truly mean opportunity. We get these opportunities in every moment of our life. This one gave her the opportunity to make a slight personal change the next day, and she had declined. In any event, she's now sitting there, and she's watching the TV, and what comes on? It's a picture of a space shuttle that's taking off, and what she's hearing is the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Rockets ignition. <laughs> and the spaceship starts to take off, and the smoke is billowing, and it's propelling towards the heavens. And in that moment, she has this realization. Five, four, three, two, one are the most powerful sequence of numbers that could possibly exist in the universe. And if she starts using them to take action, she can change her life. And after that moment, her life is never the same. So when she tells you that she was at the lowest of the low, friends, she absolutely was. That makes everything else she's doing even more inspiring. Because no matter where you are in your life's journey, this can change it. 
for whatever reason, I've never gotten too far away from what it feels like to really struggle and to feel alone and to think you're the loser on the planet that feels the way that you feel or that has screwed up your life or just can't seem to get it together. And I think that one of the coolest things that you can do is let other people know not only that they're not alone, but that this is normal to dig a hole and fall in it. It's normal to wish somebody would rescue you. It's normal to feel like a loser. It's normal to like start to feel very discouraged because the things that matter take a lot of time to come true and to, you know, emerge in the real world. And if I can save somebody the headache and the heartache that I cause myself, whether it's struggling with anxiety for decades or it's dyslexia or it's ADHD, which I didn't get diagnosed with until I was in my uh, late 40s, or it's issues and struggles in a marriage or a relationship. I or... think that, that makes you an honorary real estate agent if you have ADHD, <laughs> just yes. so you know, you're not one of us. Yes. That if I can save somebody the headache and heartache and translate the very simple you know, translate some of this amazing research and science into simple things somebody can do. That's a life well lived. The hallway is filling up. And I get Love a text it. message from somebody that said, I was getting out of the real estate business when I returned back to Wisconsin. Mm. And now I'm staying in the real estate business and I've rediscovered my passion. And when I asked why, she wrote 54321. And so I want you to know, um, you're changing lives daily. And I'm so grateful. You're such a friend to our industry and to anyone who wants to live a bigger life. Well, here's the thing. I love hearing how far-reaching these simple tools are and how much it empowers people. But I don't, I always say to people, you have to keep the credit because you're the one that has to do the work in Wisconsin. And I ignited something in you and I'm handing you a tool that will help you keep that flame lit because it is a daily game. Like you gotta be able to dig deep and wake up every day and five, four, three, two, one, keep pushing yourself forward. And to me, I think that there's so, we get ourselves so stuck in the darkness in our head that if I can offer any kind of hope that ignites something in someone else to start to believe in themselves again, based on the, actions they're taking. See, I think believing in yourself is not enough. You have to prove it to yourself. And I prefer to take the action first and let the belief catch up. And I think that's the other mistake that you make is that you're waiting to feel ready and you're waiting to believe in yourself and you're waiting for a guarantee that all of this work is going to turn out the way you want it to. And that's a major mistake. You have to take the action and start the business or keep on going or getting yourself out of bed before you feel ready to do it. And as you see yourself taking the action, your brain and your mindset catches up because you're proving it to yourself. I love it. I love it. Mel, for everyone out there that's driving and has now pulled over to take notes because they are riveted, where should we send them? Where can they Just go, go to, to melrobbins.com? There it is. Listen to the Mel Robbins podcast. Then We're in 194 be... countries. and uh, 194 countries? Uh-huh. Friends, I'm telling you, it's one of my favorite podcasts. You're crazy if you don't do it. Mel, last question. We want you to enter the lightning round. We want to ask you a series of quick questions. From okay. The first thing that comes to your mind. Will you play with us? Sure. What is your favorite color? I Well, I don't know. Green. What's your favorite food? Tacos. Stop the lightning round. They're so good. Yes. They're so good. And living in, you can do so many things with a taco. Yes. Love that. Back in. Mel, favorite movie? My, uh, there's a movie called um, About Time that is our family's favorite movie, and we all sob like crazy when we watch it. <laughs> we're saps. So good. Is there a sound that you love to hear? Our daughter just sang at Carnegie Hall on Friday night, and um, that opening note, right, like the she walked up to the mic, and you could hear a pin drop. And her friend, Phil Cook, started playing 
the opening kind of acoustic sound to this song that she released on Spotify called Pastime. And just in between the notes, there was this incredible space and quiet. And that almost sound in between the notes and the anticipation of her about to open her mouth and start singing, that is a moment I will never, ever forget as a mom. I am I'm now canceling the rest of the questions in the lightning round because it will never be that good. And I'll that give was, you the video. It was the can single put it on there. greatest answer that we've had to that question. What's your daughter's name? Kendall Robbins. And the name of the song again? Pastime. She is a journeyer. Friends, I can't do any better than this. The people we are bringing you are absolutely the biggest thinkers in the world when it comes to running big lives and running big businesses. Now, if you were driving during this entire thing and you want the notes, you want the secrets, you can go to mreanotes.com. MREANotes.com. Enter your email address. We send them out weekly and we will send them to you. MREANotes.com. What can you say? What, what can you actually say about Mel Robbins other than if this isn't the voice in your head, I don't understand why. 54321. Go listen to more of Mel. You know why? Because Mel is action-based. And here's what I've come to understand, that the most powerful word that comes up in interview after interview after interview that we've done on this show is grit. And grit is nothing other than being able to take actions when others refuse. When it gets hard, they just go. And it's not because they have this preponderance of personal discipline. They don't have this giant tank of energy that you don't. What they do have is the ability to just simply get going. Movement creates emotion. That's all there is to it. Friends, I'm ending this episode with the most simple of context. I'm going to say it, and then this whole thing is going to end, and I want you to internalize it. Are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. There it is. That wraps another episode. Friends, I don't know what you're taking out of this. I really don't. I'll tell you what I want you to be taking out of it, which is these are the people that are having tremendously big lives. And the reason it's happening is because they're setting up the models and systems to do just that. Gary Keller told me that leadership is teaching people how to think so that they do the things they need to do when they need to do them, so that ultimately they get the things they want when they want to have them. And that's what I want for you. You're all leaders, but it begins with leading ourselves. If you're enjoying this podcast, I want you to click the subscribe button anywhere that you get your podcasts. We want to be the voice in your head every single week, and every week we're dropping new content. We also send out a newsletter at the conclusion of every show to make sure that you get the highest points and the models and systems that were discussed. So if you want to sign up, I need your name and your email address. Head over to the millionaireagentpodcast.com. Millionaireagentpodcast.com. Enter your name and your email address, and every week that newsletter will be in your box. Friends, you just went on a journey. I hope that what happens between now and the next time we meet is absolutely wonderful for you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information. 